Great, okay. Good morning, we are here with Deloitte Consulting. My name is Jane Chung and this is my amazing team. Uh, Brianna Carrier, Kyle Coleman, and Camille Daly. So today we are here today to present our proposal for how the Health Improvement Commission can best use the $100,000 grant for streamlining Medicaid in the state. A quick overview of our agenda today. First, we'll provide a brief overview of the current situation and why a streamlining process is necessary. Next, we'll examine the options for grant allocation between two agencies. And lastly, we will provide a recommendation for which option most is, is most feasible and could best achieve your program goals based on our findings and rationale. So why are we here today? The purpose is to create a new Medicaid eligibility and enrollment system that allows the state to take advantage of the 9010 federal funding under the Affordable Care Act. This system would address the concerns of the two main current actors of the system, the Department of Community Health and its local offices, regarding the inefficient and overburdened Medicaid process. In our conversation with the Department of Community Health, they share their mission, which seeks to process Medicaid-eligible individuals in a timely and an efficient manner, which we took into great consideration when determining how best to use the grant money without slowing down the process anymore. Our proposal will focus on achieving the program goals listed here, in which helped us assess and determine between two options, which Brianna, Brianna, I apologize, will discuss further. Okay, great, thank you, Jane. And um, as we noted, there are two options for our grant proposal, one coming from the Department of Corrections and the other coming from the Department of Veterans Services. And essentially, both uh, programs have similar outputs, but the Department of Corrections, they want to use the grant funding to enroll inmates who are being hospitalized into Medicaid, which could potentially save millions of dollars because hospitalization is very expensive. On the other hand, Department of Veterans Services wants to use the grant funding to refer veterans to Veteran Affairs Benefit Services rather than them being involved in Medicaid, which is a state program. And we felt when we were analyzing the two different proposals that there's a fundamental difference in where their revenue was coming from, which is ultimately why we did go with the Department of Veteran Services for the allocation. So why DVS and not DOC? So DOC has a good, great program planned already, but we felt like it saved the DOC money and not quite the state money, which would be more helpful for the public benefit. And so based off of the numbers that we were given from DOC, they could save potentially maybe $11 million a year, which is a lot of money. But that comes off of the assumption that all 7% of inmates, of the 50,000 inmates who were hospitalized were eligible for money. So we think that some of the assumptions for DOC were a little bit too lofty and not really valid for, um, or not really, you know, couldn't really be viable with this grant process. And also, it kind of just shifts the state burden. So not really saving the state <coughs> any money, but just adding to the burden of the state because we're having to pay for Medicaid inmates as well. On the other hand, the Department of Veteran Services is taking the veterans off of Medicaid and shifting their costs to federal, to the Veteran Affairs benefits, which not only gives them better services, but it opens up those precious limited state resources for the public benefit in, within the state. So we decided to go with the Department of Veteran Services, mostly because we feel they meet both our bottom double lines, or double bottom lines, both cost savings and public benefit. And we did go through a people process technology um, foundation when we were analyzing both of these services. So we felt with DOC, we were gonna have to start from too much of a ground zero, whereas DVS, gleaned from the meetings that we had with both agencies, already has a partnership built up with VA, and we can really hit the ground running and use this $100,000 most effectively and really quickly. And so what we are piloting going forward with the Department of Veteran Services is this program called Veterans First. And the tagline for that is ensuring the highest quality benefits for those who have served the highest honor. And this program is what Camille will be telling you about. Thank you. So uh, to begin with this program, we wanted to state a few of our assumptions that we, we developed, um, or that we took into consider when we developed this. So first and foremost, based off of the data set that was provided by uh, DBS, we're assuming that 80% of veterans who are on Medicaid are actually veteran affairs um, eligible, which means that they could actually be in the VA system instead of Medicaid. Um, secondly, we assumed that if an individual is referred to the VA office, that they will then be enrolled. We 
We also assumed um, after talking to DCH that the Paris system is currently in place with the state. It is being utilized. Um, and with this new program, we would continue to utilize that program in a new and unique way. Um, so let's get down to the nuts and bolts of the actual proposal. So you came to us asking for four goals that you wanted to achieve with a uh, with the department that ended up with the grant funding. And the first goal that was communicated to us was to streamline the business process. Now, through Veterans First, we believe this can be accomplished with two main approaches. First, a reactive approach and a proactive approach. So the reactive approach is for veterans who are currently on Medicaid or in the application process of Medicaid who are actually VA eligible. What we recommend is creating an automated system to work in conjunction with the state's already existing system of Paris and the Medicaid application to the state. This idea is very similar to the Washington State program um, piloted by Bill Allman over 10 years ago, which has been extremely successful and has been emulated on over 30 states. Recently, California did a similar program. Of course, they tweaked it to their state-specific needs, and they also found great success. By moving 24 veterans um, in MedCal over to the VA system, the state, by, with just 24 veterans, saved $1.6 million. So essentially, what would happen is, when a veteran goes in to apply for state Medicaid, they fill out requisite information. One of the things that they would click on is if they are a veteran. With this automated system, the database would essentially flag the application because it's, the applicant has indicated that they are a veteran. This system would then communicate all applicants for veterans to the Department of Veteran Services. Veteran Services would then get the appropriate information so they could automate a message to the veteran saying, hey, we understand you're a veteran. Are you aware of VA benefits? From our conversation with DBS, it became apparent that a big issue with why veterans aren't actually applying to um, the VA is a lack of awareness. So by having this automated system, it helps actually encourage uh, veteran education and awareness of the system. Once DBS contacts the veteran, they, uh, DBS will put them in contact with their local veterans regional office, the RO, where they will be assisted in um, filling out their initial claims, disability claims, um, VA 21 and 22As, all of that will be handled uh, by experienced professionals. Now, it's, it's important to realize with this reactive approach that this is actually tangible, this can work. And why? It's because DBS has an established relationship with the VA and the VA regional offices. The staff at DBS knows the VA healthcare system and the benefit system, and they're eager to work with um, DCH for Medicaid, with veterans, and to use the Paris system. The um, other way of looking at this is the proactive approach. So instead of waiting until veterans have applied for Medicaid, gets them before they even get to that process. So from a proactive standpoint, um, one big thing we want to focus on is community outreach. And through conversations with DBS, it became apparent they're not currently doing much to actually engage with the veterans. Essentially, they're kind of holding back, waiting for veterans to come to them. So again, through the automated system, which would trigger an actual communication and conversation with the veteran, that's a great way to actually reach into the community of veterans. Secondly, we propose a social media campaign, especially for young veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, to make them aware of what the VA can actually do for them. And third, through institutes like the Institute for Veteran and Military Affairs, um, located in Syracuse, New York, um, and other veteran outreach programs across the country, this state can actually use existing veteran programs that utilize um, social media and community outreach to um, spread the message of veterans' affairs. We also encourage DBS to go to town hall meetings, other veterans' affairs meetings, and let people know what their options actually are. Which brings us into the second goal of improving coordination among agencies. So from our understanding, the goal of the commission, or one of the roles that your commission plays, is to actually facilitate a relationship between agencies. So with this, we would encourage um, the commission to help DBS, maybe if they don't have a strong relationship with a local military base, to start that connection. Um, since the commission is being um, directed by the governor directly, it could help open some doors for the DBS and for Veterans Affairs. And um, that also brings us to our community service. So by automatically reaching out to veterans through the automated system, we actually are giving a customer to veterans actual service, which has been a, a huge downfall to the system thus far. Um, and so those would be the, the three kind of first parts of the uh, double bottom line, the actual
actual substantive, how are you helping the public? The last one would be the potential cost savings. And Kyle will get to um, how we got to this number in just a few minutes. So just to kind of show you a breakdown of how we expect um, DBX to actually use the $100,000 grant, you can see that a lot of this is actually built into um, building a sustainable infrastructure through an application and then training people to actually use it, and then there's the social media aspect. Now, we, for, we anticipate actually inviting Bill Allman to come out from Washington State and training people, you know, how to actually use Paris, how this can actually benefit the state, how to make it unique to our state system, because we can't just replicate. We have to be able to apply it to our specific needs. Sure, so in terms of how we got that number, we started with the 2.7 million uh, Medicaid recipients in the state, then from there we took 7%, which we were told 7% of Medicaid beneficiaries. Those are, we have the graphs and the assumptions there to look at. Uh, of the 2.7, 7% of Medicaid beneficiaries are veterans. From using our sample, we found that 80% of veterans in Medicaid were eligible for VA. And then from there, we took the annual cost for veterans on average and multiplied by that pool that is in Medicaid right now, but could actually be on VA instead. And so our proposal is to try and move them from Medicaid over to VA. Uh, what this chart shows, the blue line, is our work in moving that population over. So each year, how many, what percentage of that pool is shifting over? And so the first year we started with an assumption of 25% because we wanted to allow some time for the system to be built and for people to find out about it. And then over time, we've leveled it off a little bit because people would find out more about it, they would be more comfortable with the system, we would get some of the kinks out, some of the problems out, and then over time it would go down because the people remaining in the system would probably be tougher to get. Just by nature, over time, the ones left would be tougher. And the green line would show the portion still in Medicaid over time, which makes sense, it just goes quicker at the beginning and then levels off a little bit. <coughs> This follows up on that last slide, so this gives sort of a numerical figure. So this, as a whole, is the total population that is in Medicaid right now that would be qualified to be in the VA instead. And that's based on the calculation we did earlier. And so what this is showing is, over this 10-year projection, how many of those have moved from Medicaid over to VA? And so as you see that green line, the green part getting bigger and bigger, the share of them going over to VA, we assume will be bigger and bigger as our program takes hold. Um, and this blue line is the one still in Medicaid. So ideally, we're gonna wanna get that down as much as possible. And lastly, this would be the cumulative savings. And this takes into account the population that's shifting out, as well as the change in uh, reimbursement rates from the federal government, going from 90% to 80%. <coughs> and so, in conclusion, we would take that $100,000 investment and we would invest it, a lot of it, in automation so that we could use it in the first year and try to have limited resources necessary for years to come. Uh, we believe on the high end it could be $266 million, but again, that's ideal. Um, so if we do as well as we think we could, it would be really high, but either way, it's going to be a huge return on investment. Uh, so yeah, going off that, just we could get the whole system in place in a year but we would still expect the effort to continue on through the use of these automated tech, uh, messaging systems. And lastly, uh, we can improve the service for veterans because the VA is more adept at dealing with veteran issues uh, as opposed to Medicaid. So not only are we gonna save a lot of money, but as part of that double bottom line, we're gonna actually give them better care too. And this is all possible because our state is going veterans first. So we'd like to take any questions you might have. So, I'm not familiar with the Paris system, but as you know, we're already building an integrated eligibility system for Medicaid, so I'm a little bit confused about your proposal about building another system. Why would, why would we go that route and do another large investment? So, based on our conversations with the Department of Community, Community Health, a concern they have is they have like 10 programs that they're looking to when going through Medicaid eligibility. Because we've chosen our subject group to be veterans, this would be veteran specific. Um, the Paris program would specifically look at veterans who had applied in the program and identify them as veterans for the use of, of this program. 
And the reason that, I guess your question might be, it seems redundant to have an additional program, but actually, because of the data and research that we've seen with other states, this is an extremely effective way of moving the cost from the state to the federal government. And the application that we're looking to build would draw on that specific information to send out the text or the emails or the phone calls and notify all of our staff. So it gives us more of a, a really veteran-centric view of who could be eligible to move over to the VA. And I think streamlining the process into one application. And you can think of the program as more of a supplemental add-on to an already existing program. So if you're already coming up with a program similar to Paris where you're considering eligibility, the Veterans First program is really targeted. So it's not creating the system all over again, kind of reinventing the wheel. It's using the system that we're already using, and you said you're developing one. But our specific program will be targeting veterans. So we had a tougher time sort of calculating yeah. that conversion, but yeah. this program would be mostly based on converting people who are in Medicaid yeah. just because of the information we have. Okay. But additionally, with the proactive approach that we talked about earlier and making sure veterans, when they got discharged, had the information to even prevent them from applying for Medicaid. So that's why there's a two farm approach. This is the reactive model of they are still applying for Medicaid, let's get them out, but also keeping in mind the proactive model of don't even let them get to the point of applying to Medicaid because they've already applied for VA benefits. So really the benefits could be more if we were able to reach some new incoming veterans, but we didn't even include them in this. So we would need a program, I think, uh, and I, I, we had, we're busy days with this, sorry, but my brain's getting foggy. Um, we would need a program, though, uh, in combination with the broader military, because we have Ohio and serving, or Virginia, whatever state we're in, serving in, multiple countries, multiple states, so they would need to know specifically if they're separating uh, from a particular military base and they're a, a resident of our state to roll in VA benefits. Yeah. So from our, my understanding about how the military works, when there's, if there's like a local base example, here's Fort Drum. If they're discharged from Fort Drum, they have a discharge officer that gives them the records information for, you know, here's what you need to do. Our goal would be for the people who are being discharged in our state to give them the records and information. But then also, if a member gets discharged in Louisiana and then comes back home mm -hmm. and they try to apply for Medicaid, the new system that we would implement would also catch them. So it's serving maybe veterans who are discharged here directly, but who would still be applying for the state Medicaid system. Okay, but the, okay, still assuming that 100% of all separating vets would move Maybe that kind of risk averse people. What risk or challenges can we expect? Yeah, 
there are some potential threats that we were uh, trying to identify for both of the programs. For DOC, which is ultimately, of course, why we didn't go with it, we felt like there were threats because the relationships weren't there. Okay, sorry. That there were, the relationships weren't there. Um, and that there is basically more opportunity within DBS to partner, which is kind of one of the key points, priorities that the commission had. Um, a threat to the DBS system will, of course, be, well, there's a risk that people may not want to be associated with VA benefits. So our assumption just holds very high standards because we want to try and reach those lofty goals. Um, but that is a risk that we do take into account. Um, potential weaknesses that we looked at through DBS were things like um, if there's going to be like maintenance costs beyond this, who's going to want to take on that financial burden? Is there going to be people costs beyond this? Who's going to want to take on that burden? And when we were meeting with the different agencies, um, DOC, DBS, and DCH, um, it seemed that most of the burden between the two underlying agencies, they wanted DCS to take a lot of the responsibility for that. So to make it easier on all three of those agency players that are in action, and on you as well, was to make this an automated system that we could foundationally train people on so that it wouldn't take as much people power to process in the future. And another criticism we got from DCH about issues that they were having with the current system is that it wasn't very uh, intuitive. There's the paper system, there's the electronic system, and the current system being used by DCH is not friendly to an electronic database. So with this being so automated and so simple, I mean, the key here really is this, the simplicity of this program is that if you had someone new come on, week one, by Monday, by Friday, they should be able to completely understand what the program works and sustainable from that aspect. And I think we would be, we would want to caution to be sort of caution, or caution how you react with veterans when you're sending out these notifications. So when they come into the Medicaid system, we don't want to just spam them with, you know, you should go to the VA, but it's really, it's a resource because the VA should be able to provide them better care. Yeah, yeah I think there's real change management components that we should be aware of and, and how we treat the veterans and how we work with them. So they, they do technically have a choice, right? Right. And one of the benefits to DBS is they are veterans who are actually working um, for DBS, so we feel like that actually gives us an advantage here because they've been in their shoes. They have a great relationship with the VA and the regional offices, so they know how to talk that language with the other veterans. I understand the, the pitch here and why this would be a good way to go, but I'm a little bit confused. Did you do a financial analysis for DOC and what the possible cost savings are there? We did run through just some DOC numbers, so the assumption that we made given the information we were given in our Excel sample was that if all of the if all of the 50,000 inmates of them 7% were the ones who were admitted into the hospital every year, or 5% admitted into the hospital every year, it came out to about 11 million dollars. But we couldn't actually find how much of that 11 million. I think it was 11 million 150,000, something like that. Um, we couldn't actually figure out a ratio based off of our meetings and our information of how much of that chunk of money was actually going to be covered by Medicaid. So we didn't know the eligibility of the inmates. So having that number to go off of, and it is a very high number, $11 million each year can add up very quickly. Um, but when we were comparing that cost analysis with public benefit, we felt that DOC was saving DOC money and not necessarily the state money. Is it DOC funded by the state? It is funded by the state, but we felt that it was more shifting state money within state whereas in the Department of Veterans Services could take state burden and give it to the federal government to enroll veterans into VA affairs. And another thing that we talked about with uh, the DOC was there seemed to be a hands-off approach, which could have actually been more costly. It seems as though maybe the DOC wanted um, the Department of DCH to kind of handle all of it, which we thought could potentially be more costly in the long run with implementation. Well, when we met with DCH, her, one of her main concerns was the time. She was very committed to getting as many people enrolled as possible. And when we kind of pitched the idea of having to work with the other agencies, um, DOC kind of makes an assumption that they would be able to enroll somebody at any time and that the benefits would be there right away. Um, so she sort of bristled at that and kind of wanted to make sure that this process, if you're going to add a burden to DCH, enrolling inmates at whichever time the DOC chooses, the proposal hopefully would have cleared that up. Um, but it would have slowed down the system even more. And she was very focused on efficiency, very focused on getting people streamlined in. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot.